Good evening, this is VK3. Oops, French, that's it. That's it. Good evening, this is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. I know it. Just trying to work out where I was hearing myself coming through. Just mute that. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and also via the Melbourne television repeater, VK3 RTV digital channel 1. Also streaming on my YouTube channel, uh, which you can find if you type in VK3 CSJ in the YouTube search engine. And we also have an email address if you wish to send reports, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com. And we have a Discord chat window. Uh, install uh, Discord and look for uh, ASV Radio uh, or something similar <laughs> uh, in the Discord uh, search and uh, you'll find our chat window. A uh, very pleasant uh, good evening to everybody on this uh, 23rd of June 2023. Well, we have a, a short session tonight. <laughs> I say that every week and we always go over time. Anyway, we've got a few things and uh, uh, we'll see if we can get through uh, most of uh, what I've just sort of put together in the last 30 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. Um... Yes, and uh, very sad news about the uh, five people who lost their lives in the uh, submersible uh, this week. So it's really uh, been something of interest to me and I guess a lot of people. So uh, uh, it's, it's interesting how they, uh, um, it appears they did actually detected the uh, implosion, uh, but they weren't, of course, obviously 100% sure what the sound was. But it seems that the sonar devices that, that were in the water at the time uh, were able to, were actually detected the, the moment of implosion, but they just didn't know. Anyway, th perhaps, but there's lots to, to come from all this, and uh, uh, it's a, a bit of a sad thing. Uh, but that's another story. Anyway, you're tuned to uh, VK3 EKH uh, on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. All right. Um, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922. It comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about the state and Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, with the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullia Hall National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, in the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV magazine called Crux, which contains articles, news, observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens, and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan 
so members can try before they buy. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two with appropriate training, and these range from 300mm to 1000mm in size aperture. Also located on the site is a fully steerable 8.5 metre radio telescope which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing cosmology and astrophysics. Historical studies and research in astronomy in general all catered for one way or another. There are actually about 21 sections that make up the various activity groups within the ASV. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, but if you don't have the yearbook, uh, further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of each or of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletins which are sent out via email to members every other week. Please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. If you wish to write to the ASV but via snail mail, the uh, address is the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. Otherwise, visit the website at www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. You're tuned to ASV Radio VK3EKH coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ in Narry Warren South. Uh, now, let's see. What was the first thing I had for tonight? Uh, oh, yes, okay. So, I hope everybody is in good mood tonight. Um, I'm not seeing anybody up on our chat chat window yet. I'm hoping it's working. Um, I'll just uh, maybe I'm in the wrong position here. I'll uh, cursor down. It's probably a little bit better. Huh? Yes, I think that's it. So, a very pleasant good evening to David, VK3KDM, Martin, VK7JAH, Graham, VK3GRK up at Bendigo, and Steve, VK3SBX, and and David again. <laughs> that's all on the. That's all happening on the chat window. Oh, uh, we also are broadcasting via the British Amateur Television Club server tonight. I can see that it's working. So the BATC video server is working. Well, it's not so much that, but we are broadcasting a stream through it. So if you can't see the YouTube uh, stream I'll be, and, and horribly annoyed by the 20-second delay, the f video feed via the BATC stream is actually a little quicker. Um, and... Uh, just waiting for me. I just waved at the camera. It's already five, ten, coming up to ten seconds. Oh, it might be a little bit delayed on the BATC feed as well. In fact, it's almost the same. I thought it was a bit quicker. Anyway, <laughs> just, who cares? Um, all right. This article uh, comes from the astronomy.com website, courtesy. The second ever elusive white dwarf pulsar spotted 
There's actually a little graphic I can bring up here, but it's only a, <clears throat> an, il uh, an illustration. It's a, it's a white dwarf pulsar beams radiation from its poles, which interacts with a companion star to cause a brightening effect. So uh, this is what that looks like. And uh, the article goes on to say, Astronomers have captured their second ever glimpse into a rare celestial object, a white dwarf pulsar. Pulsars are typically envisioned as spinning neutron stars, a type of stellar remnant left over by uh, left by only massive stars. Despite white dwarfs being the most common stellar fossils created by sun-like and smaller stars, pulsar emission has only been observed once before from a white dwarf. The find may illuminate aspects of star formation, their evolution, and how these objects generate their strong magnetic fields. The new find, the pulsar consists of a white dwarf in a binary system that blasts a neighbouring red dwarf with mighty beams of particles and electromagnetic radiation. It's dubbed J191213.74410 decimal one or J1912-4410 for short. Thank goodness for that. The white dwarf pulsar spins 300 times faster than Earth. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, or about once every five minutes. And despite being a similar size to our, 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 our home planet, the white dwarf has a mass as large as the sun. A white dwarf is born after a sun-like star exhausts its fuel leaving behind its hot core with a temperature of some 180,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees, 100,000 degrees Celsius. The new white dwarf will then begin to cool and spin more slowly, unless it's accumulating nearby matter. That's because pulling material off a companion star can keep the white dwarf rotating more quickly instead of slowing down. Due to their old age, the white dwarfs in the pulsar system should be cool. Their companions should be close enough that the gravitational pull of the white dwarf was in the past strong enough to capture mass from the companion, and this causes them to be fast spinning, said Ingrid Pearsall a binary evolution expert at the University of Warwick and a study author. In a statement, all of those predictions hold for the new pulsar found. J1912-4410 has already cooled to about 12,800 degrees, indicating it is old, but its period of five minutes is relatively fast. All that fits perfectly with the picture astronomers have of a white dwarf pulsar system. Although astronomers know the white dwarf magnetic field powers the pulsars, they are still investigating the exact driving mechanism. In neutron star pulsars, no companion star is required. But in white dwarf pulsars, researchers think the beams of energy from the spinning white dwarf accelerate electrons in the atmosphere of the neighbouring red dwarf to close to the speed of light. The team spotted the brightening associated with this phenomenon while searching for white dwarf pulsars. They used a camera dubbed UltraCam on the, the, the 3.58 metre new technology telescope in La Silla, Chile which is capable of taking 500 pictures a second to detect rapid changes in light. J1912-4410 follows in the footsteps of the first white dwarf pulsar discovered in 2016. The star system AR Scorpii is located 380 light years away in the constellation Scorpius. The pulsar has a period of 1.97 minutes over a broad range of wavelengths. 
including radio and x-rays. Before this discovery, astronomers had theorized white dwarf pulsars could exist, but had fruitlessly searched for them for more than five decades. All other known pulsars and neutron stars that rotate rapidly, some thousands of times per second, their strong magnetic fields create focused beams released from their poles as they whirl, sending out radio waves and high energy electromagnetic radiation. But what causes the strong magnetic fields in a white dwarf remains unknown. The team suspects that the white dwarf's core may harbor a dynamo, the same mechanism that powers Earth's magnetic field. As the white dwarf spins up by accelerating matter, the dynamo effect is intensified, leading to a magnetic field strong enough to cause the pulsar effect we see. The origin of magnetic fields is a big open question in many fields of astronomy, and this is particularly true for white dwarf stars. The magnetic fields in white dwarfs can be more than a million times stronger than the magnetic field of the Sun, and the Dynamo model helps to explain why. The discovery of J1912-4410 provides a critical step forward in this field. Pasole said, with two examples now instead of one, researchers can learn more about these objects and build better models to describe them, even as they continue searching for more. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 C. S. J. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Coffee without sugar. Still trying to get used to that. Okay, next article, courtesy of space.com. And there's a picture of this too, so I'll throw that up as well for those watching the vision side of this broadcast. NASA, that's how you say it, NASA, <laughs> not NASA, NASA will study the Great American Solar Eclipse of 2024 with these five experiments, published one hour ago. The eclipse will be visible to many people in North America on April 8, 2024, and you can imagine that There'll be lots of people heading from all over the world to see yet another eclipse. Nevertheless, NASA has selected five science experiments that will fund to study that will fund to study the Sun and Earth during the Great American Eclipse of 2024. The Great American Eclipse. On April 8, 2024, a total solar eclipse during which the Moon completely blocks out the disk of the Sun will darken skies across the United States. The path of totality averaging 123 miles or 198 kilometers wide runs from southwest Texas to northern New England and includes cities such as San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, Little Rock, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, Rochester and a few other places. The duration of totality will vary depending on viewers' location, ranging from nearly four and a half minutes in Texas to about three and a quarter minutes in Maine. This total solar eclipse gives scientists a unique opportunity to study the interaction between the sun and the moon, of course. Seven years after the last American total solar eclipse, we're thrilled to announce the selection of five new projects that will study the 2024 eclipse. Peg Luce, Acting Director of Heliophysics Division in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington, said in a statement from the agency, We're excited to see what these new experiments will uncover about our Sun and its impact on Earth. 
The five NASA-selected projects are led by researchers at different academic institutions and encourage citizen scientists to participate too. The experiments will use a variety of instruments including cameras aboard high-altitude research planes, ham radios and spectrometers. Scientists have long used solar eclipses to make scientific discoveries. Kelly Corrick, program scientist at NASA's headquarters, said in the statement, They have helped us make the first detection of helium, have given us evidence for the theory of general relativity, and allowed us to better understand the sun's influence on Earth's upper atmosphere, she said. One of the projects selected will use NASA's BW-57 high-altitude research aircraft, which will chase the eclipse, capturing images of the moon's shadow from an altitude of 15,000 metres above Earth's surface. The plane is equipped with cameras to capture images in infrared and visible light at high resolution and high speed. This will allow scientists to study the sun's outer atmosphere called the corona, as well as dust rings around the sun where asteroids may be found. The cameras on NASA's BW57 will also be used on a project that aims to study the temperature, structure and chemical composition of the corona and large bursts of solar material known as coronal mass ejections CMEs. Using ham radios, researchers will study changes in Earth's ionosphere during the total solar eclipse to better understand the impact on radio wave transmissions Generally, this region of the atmosphere is electrically charged or ionized by energy from the sun, which begins, or I should say, which benefits radio communications. Therefore, this experiment, called the Solar Eclipse QSO Party, and why not, invites ham radio operators in different areas to test how the strength of their radio signals is affected when the moon blocks out the sun's powerful rays. Another experiment using data from the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, that's the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, or SuperDAN, <laughs> will also take a close look at the ionosphere and the effect solar radiation has on the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere during the eclipse. Three SuperDAN radars, which generally monitor space weather conditions, are located in areas that fall within the telescope's shadow. Sorry, the eclipse's shadow. I have another cup of coffee here, I think. <sighs> Lastly, NASA will fund a project designed to study changes in solar active regions. The magnetically complex regions that form over sunspots. Using Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope, in California, researchers will study light signals coming from different active regions as the moon passes between the sun and earth. You can read more about each five NASA funded solar eclipse telescopes online. There's a link of course. Editors note, never look at the sun with binoculars, a telescope or your unaided eye without special protection. Of course I had to throw that in. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Time is 10.24. A very pleasant good evening to our resident shortwave listener, Daz, up in Brisbane. Um, and that's all I can see there so far, thus far. He's saying something's just failed. I'm sure that is. Um, okay, next uh, item. And this was published seven days ago. Courtesy of space.com again. Uh, surprise! Jupiter's ocean moon Europa may not have a fully formed core. 
uh, we found that Europa may have spent most of its life without fully formed metallic core, that is, if such a core exists at all. The core of Jupiter's ocean moon Europa might have formed billions of years after the rest of it did, if indeed it was formed at all, a new study finds. Europa, Jupiter's fourth largest moon, is covered in an icy shell. Actually, I've got a picture of it here for those watching the video side of things. That's it, that's Europa. <coughs> Jupiter's intriguing ocean moon Europa as seen by NASA's Galileo spacecraft. Beautiful moon, can't wait to go there. <laughs> anyway, Europa's Jupiter's fourth largest moon is covered with an icy shell. However, researchers suspect that underneath its frozen crust, Europa hosts a saltwater ocean churning over its rocky mantle. It may possess more liquid water than Earth. Study lead author Kevin Trin, a planetary scientist at Arizona State University in Tempe, told space.com. Previous research suggests that Europa may be habitable. For instance, seafloor volcanoes and hydrothermal vents may help deliver life-sustaining heat and biological useful molecules in its oceans. In order to know whether such potential life-supporting activity might take place on Europa, scientists must understand the nature of the Jupiter's moon's interior and how it might have evolved over time. While Europa is famously known as a potentially habitable ocean world, over 90% of Europa's mass comes from rock and metal, Trin said. After NASA's Gelo, sorry, after NASA's Galileo spacecraft reached the Jovian system in 1995, its analysis of Europa's gravity field suggested that Europa's interior, like that of Earth, is divided into a metallic core and a rocky mantle. Subsequent research often assumed that Europa's interior split into these layers as, or soon after, the Jovian moon formed. How Now, now to our surprise, we found that Europa may have spent most of its life without a fully formed metallic core, and that is, if such a core exists at all, Trin said. A 2021 study that re-examined the Galileo data suggested that Europa might be less massive near its centre than previously thought. This would then rise the question or raise the question of whether it possesses a fully formed core. One reason Europa might not have a fully formed core is that it's likely formed much colder temperatures than Earth did due to the icy moon's greater distance from the Sun. This means that, as Europa's building blocks came together, they may not have melted and separated into a metallic core and rocky mantle. Trin and his colleagues developed a computer model of how temperatures in Europa's interior changed over four and a half billion years assuming relatively low temperature in, in ter, um, initial temperatures of minus 73 degrees Celsius to 26 degrees Celsius. The scientists found out in about the first 500,000 years after Europa's birth, its oceans and ice shell may have formed as chemical reactions led water to gradually ascend from its mantle. Europa's metallic core, if it exists, would likely have started forming at least a billion years after the moon was born. Heat from radioactive elements and tidal churning from Jupiter's gravitational pull may have melted the core slowly over Europa's lifetime. Europa may still be gradually separating into a multiple layers today. The researchers noted the formation of a metallic core would help make Europa more habitable, since metallic core formation could deliver a heat pulse to the rocky mantle, Trin said. NASA's planned Europa Clipper mission 
may help scan the Jovian moon's gravity to improve our understanding of how mass is distributed inside Europa, which relates to the existence of Europa's metallic core, Trin said. The new study was published online today, June 16, in the journal Science Advances. There's a little bit of a, an update on Europa. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. We have an email address if anybody wishes to send reports. Actually, I haven't been looking at that. Um, let me just go off the BATC feed, get my mouse to work first, and go all the way up there to where my email is. Right, there we are. There's four emails there. <laughs> So, yes, we have an email address, vk3ekh at gmail.com. So if you're over there in Western Australia listening, or perhaps in some far-off part of South New Zealand, um, or maybe somewhere between here and America, um, send us a resignal report. It's uh, the death of the, the deaths, depths, that's the word I'm trying to say, the depths of winter. So propagation's a little bit better this time of the year, is what I'm trying to say. All right, this is a little bit of a plug here too, a little bit of advertisement, you might call it. So I shall bring this up on the TV. Um, the latest episode on astrophys.com, episode 173, Dr. Jesse Van de Sandy, New Galactic Discoveries. Dr. Jesse Van de Sandy, I think that's how you pronounce it, is the Astro 3D Research Fellow at the Sydney Institute of Astronomy at the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. He is an astronomical, that is to say, he is an obser ob observational astronomer, most of us are, who used many of the world's most iconic and powerful telescopes, including the four 8-metre telescopes that comprise the VLT, very large telescope, high up in the Andes in Chile. He is researching galaxies at low and high redshift up to 15 billion light years away and his research focuses on how massive galaxies form, evolve and die. Jesse co-leads a team which has published new amazing discoveries about our very own Milky Way galaxy which some say are destined to rewrite the astronomy textbooks and he has a long history with famous SAMI survey that is S A. MI survey, whatever that stands for. In his generous and in-depth interview, we hear about his journey from small village in northern Netherlands to researching the largest structures in our universe. He brings us up to date with the Sami and Gecko th surveys, his outreach work, his latest research and collaborations, and his work on the promotion of nuclear fusion energy and our need to solve per pervasive social problems. You will love how Jesse showcases his perfectionist approach to complex and sky-breaking science with absolute approachable clarity. From this interview, you will come away with rich and clear understanding of both the exceptional scientist and his wonderful science. That's the latest interview by Brendan O'Brien on the Astrophys podcast site at astrophys.com, episode 173. So there he is, Brendan, a plug for your site there. I gather you're probably listening. Okay, what was the next article going to be at 10.34? What's the next article? Um, mine goes into a phase. Oh, there it is. Oh, this is nice and this is a nice and a quickie. And there's a diagram for this too. So I shall throw this up on the screen on YouTube on the BATC feed, whatever you're watching. <laughs> Pleasant good evening to all ATVers. Okay, this what you're looking at now, or will be in 20 seconds from now. Um. Who was it? A person by the ma name of Edward Dean in Florida asks, How many exoplanets does the transit method miss? 
Astronomers estimate we have missed hundreds of thousands of planets because they don't cross in front of the star, of their star, from our point of view. June 19, 2023, astro astronomy.com. Uh, let's see. This is a really important correction we have to make when trying to calculate what fraction of stars have planets. The probability of a planet transiting, transiting, transiting <laughs> its star from our point of view is proportional to the radius of the star. The bigger the star, the more area there is for the planet to potentially transit, divided by the distance between the star and its planet. <clears throat> Planets that are farther from their stars are less likely to transit. This probability ranges from about 1 in 10 for hot Jupiters, Jupiter-sized planets that orbit their stars in just a few days, to about 1 in 200 for Earth-sized planets that orbit their star with a period of 365 days. It's even smaller for more distant planets. Doing a quick calculation with the transiting planets, we, we've discovered so far, and examining their stellar hosts and their orbital distances, it looks like we've probably missed about 110,000 planets for the 4,000 that have been found thus far. So in, there's, there's a little bit over, I think the figure is a little bit over 4,000 now, but let's just say in the, in the 4,000 exoplanets that have been discovered orbiting their host star, and we can only do that because as the article here said, we can see the dip in light, we can detect and we can measure the dip in light from the sun, from that star, because of the planet's transition across it. So we've discovered 4,000 exoplanets as a result of that technology. And they reckon that as a result of planets that don't cross the disk of the planet or of the host star, about 110,000 planets get go undiscovered. So there it is. When you know, you, we can do this, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued that the amateur astronomer can actually do this uh, research as well. Um, there are a number of uh, astrophotographers in the ASV that have actually attached cameras to their telescopes and focused on a distant star and have actually been able to measure the star's intensity drop as the planet orbits the sun. It can be done. And uh, once I get my observatory up and running, I plan to do the same thing, or at least hope to. That'll be rather interesting to see if it can do that. Uh, anyway, go back to vMix and back to me. There we are. You're tuned to ASV Radio. G'day, John. John's just sent an email. You might ask, who's John? The K2EMF. It's a good call sign. I like that call sign. G'day, John. 20 over 9. That's a good signal report. Thank you very much, Lee, sir. Um, okay, next article. Uh, not wishing to race along at all. Next article is... Oh, yeah, this is this, this is a quickie. This is, this is actually something that... Um, uh, Kate, who looks after the space exploration uh, section, puts up on Facebook. Kate uh, is very, very thorough at putting up news articles on our Facebook page. Um, space, space exploration is the 20th section of the ASV, which was uh, opened up by Robert Arrowsmith in the beginning, and uh, Kate took it on, and uh, she's been very, very... Uh, um, What's the word? Uh, almost on a daily basis, you'll find at least two, three, or more articles being put up about the latest things in space exploration and all sorts of things. So good on you, Kate. A good source of information. And this one, I'll just put this picture up on the screen. It's a dish antenna. <clears throat> 
It's a very quick article. In fact, it's hardly an article, really. Um, anyway, what, what you're looking at on the screen right now, uh, there it is. Um, 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 space history. Uh, May 11, 1951. Wurz, Wurzburg. I don't know how you pronounce it. Wurzburg. Reese. Radio antenna detection of 21 centimeter emission from atomic hydrogen in the Milky Way galaxy. During the World War II, the German army created the Atlantic Wall along the entire European coast from Norway through Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium and France. Part of this Cam Herberlein, Cam, Cam and Herberlein, it's got to be German, uh, were overlapping radar stations using the so-called Würzburg Reese radar antennas which is what you're seeing on the screen now. After the war, several of the antennas were confiscated by the Dutch Telecommunications Service, or PTT. Some were brought to, or some, sorry, some were brought to the radio station at Kutwert in East Netherlands. PTT gave one to the Dutch Association for Radio Emission from the Sun and the Milky Way, now called Astron, A-S-T-R-O-N. On May 11, 1951, with this antenna on the screen that you're looking at, uh, Lex Muller confirmed the detection of the 21 centimeter emission from atomic hydrogen in the Milky Way galaxy just six weeks after Harold Ewan found it with his feed horn at Harvard. And that's all there is to that article. But what, what I wouldn't give to have one of those in the backyard, eh? <laughs> uh, dearie me. I love dish antennas. I've got a thing for dish antennas. Ever since I was a kid, I was making dish antennas. My first dish antenna was made out of um, a concrete cutting blade that was probably about two feet diameter and I stuck it in the remains of a wheelbarrow frame with a piece of cane sticking out the center as a feed point. I was only eight years old but I was doing it even then, making dish antennas that is. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. What time is it? Oh yeah, okay. Um, all right, that was an interesting one. Thanks, Kate, for that. <sighs> We're coming up to a very, an interesting video, so stay with us. Oh, your receiver just failed. Is that what you're saying, Daz? Well, that's no good. Um, okay, this is courtesy of Science Alert. Let me just check the length of this article. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it should be all right. <clears throat> and I've only got, I think, one image in here. Did I save any images? Yeah, that image there. All right, I'll come up to that when I come up to it. This is ASV Radio VK3 EKH. A dead star's magnetic field tricked astronomers into thinking it was heading our way. 22nd of June, 2023, science alert. The remnant of a dead star predicted to cannonball through the outskirts of the solar system is going to do no such thing after all. On re-examination, a white dwarf star just 36 light years from Earth named WD0810-353 has turned out to be pretty normal. Its only claim to strangeness is its powerful magnetic field, according to a team of astronomers led by John Lander Street of the Armagh Observatory and Planetarium in the UK. It's this magnetic field, researchers say, that led a scientist to misinterpret the trajectory of the star through the Milky Way galaxy. Their findings accepted in the Astrophysical Journal are available on 
preprint server ARXIV for those that have that access to that. Nevertheless, WD08110 <laughs> WD0810-353 is interesting in and of itself and could help scientists better understand how white dwarf magnetic fields evolve as they cool. Cool, man. The solar system doesn't exist in isolation. It belongs to a vibrant and fascinating stellar community. With every object on its own in its on its own orbit or path around the galactic center, some of those paths could result in encounters with other stars including our sun. If another star does have a close encounter with our solar system, it could produce some pretty disruptive results. So, astronomers are keen to figure out which stars, if any, are on such a trajectory. A paper published earlier this year, written by astronomers Vadim Bokev and Ansir Bokjov of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Russia, Academy of Sciences in Russia, details a handful of candidates for those close encounters in the future. The most interesting of those was a white dwarf named WD08110 I did it again WD8010-353 Using data from the GEAR mission Bobby Lev and Bajkov these are Russian names calculated that WD0810-353 is travelling at a blistering speed of 232 ah, sorry but is traveling at a blistering speed of 373.7 kilometers per second they also calculate that in just 29,000 years WD0810-353 is going to pass within 0.49 light years of our Sun that's a distance of about 31,000 astronomical units, which would bring the white dwarf within the Oort cloud, a population of small icy bodies estimated to orbit near the solar system's boundary, scattering the frozen blocks towards the inner solar system as comets. It's definitely an intriguing prospect, and one that has significant bearing on the future's system or the system's future. However, there are some problems with this finding. The GAIA data, GAIA, the GEAR or GAIA data, has given us the most accurate three dimensional map of the Milky Way to date. But there are significant limitations when it comes to using that data to calculate the velocities of white dwarfs. In fact, a follow-up study conducted by astronomers Raul de la Fluente Marcos and Carlos de la Fluente Marcos of the Complutense University in Madrid in Spain found that while the white dwarf does appear to be headed towards our solar system, its velocity was way off. Their recalc recalculation based on the hydrogen alpha line in its spectrum found that WD0810-353 was moving at an absolute in Spain, that is to say insane, pardon me, speed of more than 4,200 kilometers per second. Events in space are often violent, especially when stars reach the bottom of their fuel fu fission fuel reserves, resulting in explosions that kick the remnant cores at high speeds across the galaxy. White dwarfs are such remnant cores for stars, lower than around eight times the mass of our Sun. More massive stars collapse into neutron stars and black holes, and are often yeeted, ye yeeted <laughs> That's a new word. Y double E T E D. Yeeted. 
are often yeeted across the galaxy at high speed by uneven explosions. Yeeted. I'll have to look that up. But we've never seen a runaway star even close to that fast, they say. Now there's an interesting picture here. It's apparently a real image. So I shall bring that up. Ah, oh, goodness me. So what you're seeing there on the screen is a pulsar named J0002. And it's speeding away from a supernova at 1,130 kilometers per second. But the Spanish astronomers noted there was another possibility. They compared WD0810-353 to other white dwarfs with similar spectra using non-gear data and found a much more sedate velocity of around 60 to 70 kilometers per second. Both the new velocities, fast and slow, would rule out a close encounter between our solar system and WD0810-353. But which is it? Question mark. This is where Landstreet and his colleagues Eva Valleveur of the Astrobiology Centre in Spain and Stefano Bagnulo of Amaha Observatory and Planetarium pick up the trail. It's possible, they note, that a powerful magnetic field could distort the spectrum of a white dwarf. So they obtained new spectra and performed new analysis to derive its magnetic field. They found that the hydrogen alpha line was strongly shifted towards the bluer part of the spectrum by the white dwarf's powerful magnetic field. This can make the star appear as though it is moving towards us. Since this movement can make light wavelengths appear to compress and shorten towards the blue range, a phenomenon known as blue shifting. In this case, Landstreet and his colleagues found the blue shift results in a, a, is a, in an illusion of emotion of motion. The oh, the velocity of the star they found is closer to around 83 kilometers per second and that means it isn't a hyper velocity or runaway star and it's not going to run into the all cloud in 29,000 years or indeed at all. Nevertheless WD0810-353 is an intrinsically very interesting star the researchers write. It is one of the closest strongly magnetic white dwarfs to the Earth, with an age of almost 3 billion years. It is entering the phase of its cooling life, during which very strong magnetic fields merge to the surface of a middle-aged white dwarfs. It appears to have fairly complex distribution of local field strength over the visible surface. It will certainly be worthwhile to carry out further spectropolymetric monitoring and more detailed modeling of this object. Whew. There you go. And that's a very interesting image on the screen there. because that's a, that's a real picture. All right, you're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, ASV Radio. Oh dear. Now, this is a four minute video. I listen to 774. A lot of people don't like the ABC for some obscure reason, but I often listen to 774, particularly in the mornings as I get ready for work. So it's only for a few minutes. <clears throat> but last Friday, yes, last Friday, uh, what's his name? Charlie something or other. Uh, the announcer was interviewing a fellow by the name of Julian O'Shea. Julian O'Shea. And Julian, I believe, is a Melbourne person. And he's got a, a series of short videos on YouTube titled Unknown Melbourne. And uh, I was thoroughly entertained by most. I, I went through about uh, seven. There's How many has he, has he got? Um, there's 31. There's 31 videos, short videos he's created 
or done all on his very own I imagine but I've, so far I've, I've got to about seven <laughs> anyway um, I was a pr- surprised to learn uh, that uh, he did a short video on the solar system that exists along the St Kilda foreshore some of you might not know this uh, but um, a few years ago uh, I'm not sure when it was done I can't remember right now but a few years ago uh, the uh, along the St Kilda it's called it's called the St Kilda solar system trail and it has a one to one billion scale model of the solar system it shows the planets and the Sun at the correct relative to size and spacing it's a bit of science with your beach experience so let me write thanks to uh, to Julian for the courtesy of uh, showing this um, courtesy of uh, Julian O'Shea so I shall just cue this up so tune to your YouTube channel now or watch RTV or the BATC feed for this and uh, let's see I've got to I've got to press this button here for it to work and hopefully we'll pick up audio straight away hopefully we better all right this is VK3 EKH ASV radio I'm on the St Kilda foreshore at the side of this the solar system scale model representing the entirety of the solar system at a 1 to 1 billion scale ratio the biggest object in the solar system and our model is the sun now it's 1.39 million kilometers across, which ends up being 1.39 meters across. And it turns out it actually is hot to touch. Now that's not a design feature, it just happens to be made out of metal and sitting in the hot itself. Let's go and explore some planets. So we farewell the sun and start our journey through the solar system and down the St Kilda beach. Now this is a fantastic spot for this model. It's both lovely to be at and attracts a lot of people. So just 58 metres or 58 million kilometres away from the Sun is Mercury and it's tiny. You can see already the vast differences in size between the Sun and the first planet. And the spacing of all of the planets is also to scale and the distance between our next stop and the first is similar. And the next planet is Venus, one of Earth's neighbours. This project was built as a collaboration between art and science and shows in a real tangible way the vastness of the solar system. Although you can see for these smaller planets there's not a lot of space for detail and room for artistic flair. And next up, this is home. This is planet Earth. And Earth is the only planet that has its moon included in the model. And what this model really shows is the vast differences between the size of the objects and the distances between them. It really is called space for a reason. Next up is a journey that humans might be taking soon. And that brings us to our neighbour. This is Mars. So that's the four inner planets. From here things get a lot further, so I'm going to grab some transport and do it that way. And visiting this model can be done as a lovely walk or ride, or in my case, scoot. And the model was originally installed in 2005 as a temporary exhibition, and it had such a positive response that it was made into a permanent feature by the Council. And this is Jupiter, the biggest of the planets, and you can see a lot more of the detail on it. I'm sure the artists appreciated the ability to do that. From Jupiter we continue our journey north and through the beach going crowd who I can only assume are just like me and here for the science education. Now from here we pass the one kilometre from our starting point which represents one billion kilometres from the Sun. Then we have Saturn, one of the gas giants and probably one of the most distinctive of all the planets. So we've gone from the Sun here to Saturn and the distances get a lot further from here. And the designers did a great job engaging the Astronomical Society of Victoria and got a series of facts and information on each of the plaques, which is what I would read and say to the camera, implying they knew a lot more about the planets than I actually did. And as we get further out, we get to Uranus, one of the bigger planets with around 30 moons, and it's orientated differently than the other planets. In addition to the Port Phillip Council, this project was funded by the Planet Wheeler Foundation, who are the folks behind the Lonely Planet Guidebook Company, who helped turn this project from the paper mache original models into these permanent displays. And then we have Neptune, one of the distant gas giants, and it kind of feels right that it's located right near the sea. But I know what you're really wondering, do they have Pluto? Or did they install a Pluto and then have to take it down when it was kicked out of the Planet Club? What is the protocol for models when science makes categorization changes? Well, I had to make one of the longer trips of around 1.4 kilometres to find out. 
Okay, I've just arrived at the final spot and it's Pluto and this is the cutest thing I think I've ever seen. This is the tiny little display and look how little it is. I reckon this might be one of the smallest statues of anything in the world. It is so cute and so little. And it feels right for something which was once a planet and is no longer. Thank you, Pluto. But it turns out that's not the end. This model had one more surprise, going beyond the 0.24 centimetre long Pluto to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is around 4.2 light years away. That is 40 trillion kilometres. But what they've done as part of this model is still kept it to scale. And you might be asking, how is that possible? Well, in reality, it would be 40,000 kilometres from here. But it turns out that's the same distance as the circumference of the Earth. So it's in the right spot, but to get here, you have to do a lap of the globe. And that's the solar system. If you enjoyed that, you can come to St Kilda and check it out for yourself. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. There's a lot more cool stuff coming up. That's it from me. on the TV. There we are, we're back again. Um, so yeah, thanks to Julian O'Shea uh, for that little video and um, the next time you're um, walking along the St Kilda foreshore, take the time out to travel the length of the solar system. Might need a scooter for, for some of the most distant planets there to scale. <laughs> um, but it uh, it is interesting to see though the the the, uh, the sculpture that's been created, and I think the most interesting thing is that last one he he said there is that um, uh, the uh, where the sun is situated in this scaled system, uh, the Alpha Centauri um, is uh, uh, equivalent to work at forty thousand kilometers, and that's on the scale being used. And to get there, you would have to actually walk the circumference of the Earth to give you an idea of the, the scale of distance that we're, we're talking about here. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was most interesting. But anyway, if you, if you haven't seen that, if you couldn't see the video, um, certainly certainly uh, catch up with it because it's... Um, uh, once I stop uh, streaming tonight, it'll, it'll, the stream will be recorded on uh, YouTube and be ready to, to review again. Um, but like I say, just go to YouTube and type in Unknown Melbourne because uh, his series, series is basically titled Unknown Melbourne and uh, there's, there's quite a few interesting things he, uh, it, apart from the astronomy bent, uh, is, uh, there's a lot of other things that he uh, he goes and discovers, so it's very interesting indeed. Um, Alright, time is already now 11 o'clock, how about that? This, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. And there was one thing else I was going to mention, but I, I guess I'll leave that till next week. It's about earthquakes. It was interesting. Um, oh, what the hell? No, it's a bit there to read out, so I'll leave that till next week. Yeah, all right. So we shall go to spaceweather.com. Uh, spaceweather.com. All right, let me bring up the disk of the sun, the current view of the sun facing the earth as we speak as we've passed the shortest day of the year thank goodness all right solar space weather report courtesy of spaceweather.com um, just making sure my audio levels are right the solar wind is currently at 397.4 kilometers a second at a density of 3.08 protons per cubic centimeter. The current disk of the sun on the screen as I speak has multiple sunspots on it, quite a few in fact, <laughs> and um, <coughs> there's a lot happening with our sun at the moment. The, color, the, the current sunspot number is 176 
and the radio sun measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters the flux is 173 solar flux units 173 solar flux units they also say oh hang on let me go down further the planetary k index currently the kp index is equal to 2 which is considered quiet the 24 hour max kp figure is 2.33 also considered quiet uh, another significant solar flare however active sunspot ar3341 which produced an x flare on june 20 exploded again on june 22 this time it's an m 4.5 class flare the eruption hurled a CME into space, but we do not yet know if it has enough Earth-directed component, so stay tuned. Now this is a little interesting thing associated with t today's spaceweather.com. <coughs> Pardon me. A new way to detect solar flares. <clears throat> Around the world, ham radio operators are experimenting with a new way to detect solar flares. The Doppler shift method. Brian Curtis of May Mary, Michigan, demonstrated the technique on June 20 with the sun when the sun produced a powerful X 1.1 class solar flare. And he's got a graph here, so I'll, I'll just show, the, show you this graph. There's the graph. Um, he says, I monitored the frequency and field strength of Canada's, Canada's CHU time station transmitting on 7850 kHz, explains Curtis. During the X-Class flare event, I was able to detect the Doppler shift of the station's carrier frequency, which is the green plot. It shifted by 5 Hz, which is a small change but very obvious. He says, when radiation from a solar flare hits Earth's atmosphere, it ionizes the air temporarily boosting the thickness of our planet's ionosphere. Any radio station skipping off the ionosphere will suddenly find its frequency Doppler shifted because its reflection point is moving. Shortwave stations such as WWV and WWVH and CHU transmits carriers with atomic clock grade frequency stability. So they are perfect sources for Doppler monitoring. And there's a, another little graphic here that I can show. It's associated with this article. So it get, continues on to say that I have monitoring, I have been monitoring radio stations for decades, noting sudden changes in signal strength as a means of monitoring space weather events, says Curtis. It is only fairly recently, within four months, that I have started to experiment with monitoring the Doppler shift on HF stations. The, the June 20 X-Class flare event is by far the most dramatic that I have witnessed thus far, he says. Um, would you like to detect solar flares this way? Question mark, he asks. There's a site called Ham SCI. The HAM SCI Citizen Science Program has developed a personal space weather station specifically for Doppler shift measurements. This technique can also be used to study solar eclipses, earthquakes and tsunamis and much more. So uh, they're all links. Uh, HAM SCI, Personal Space Weather Station, Solar Eclipses, Earthquakes and Tsunamis, they're all links embedded in the uh, article here. So. I, I would suggest that you just go to spaceweather.com, today's, today's spaceweather.com, and you'll see all about that. And this is the current auroral Australis aurora over the Antarctica. Uh, it's a pretty normal, I would say. Nothing to write home about. And I think that brings us to the end of space weather. Um, there was nothing from Tamitha. <laughs> uh, so just going down the page a bit, a fair bit. Oh, where is it? Oh, I went past it. Okay. And potentially hazardous asteroids are space rocks larger than approximately 100 metres. As of June 23, 2023, 
there were 2,335 potentially hazardous asteroids. Always love reading that out. Okay, I think that's about it. So I shall now conclude. Um, I thank everybody who's come up on the chat window. Uh, Graham, GRK, Des, who says he's received a synth synthesizer and went out of lock for some reason. Might, might have been one of those cosmic rays that I was going to talk about in the earthquake article, which we'll have to wait till next week for that one. Uh, Martin, VK7JH, uh, David, VK3KDM, representing the Mount Burnett Observatory up there in the hills. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's all I see there at the moment thank you for the folks that sent uh, emails in Steve Wayne Merv Andrew and John thank you chaps very much Lee um, okay so thanks very much for listening and watching for this week and uh, this Friday session uh, we shall now open up the frequency for a callback and uh, I think I've got the audio set up so there'll be a little bit of audio fed back over uh, the system so that people can hear what comes through on 80 meters so I actually have to put my headphones on to actually hear you guys so just just hold on a sec <coughs> oh. and uh, all right this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 for uh, any stations wishing to check in. This is VK3EKH. 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 Okay, I've got VK3GL, VK3JR, VK3BDA, VK7JH, VK3SBX. Who else is there? VK3TJS. Okay, VK3TJS, and there was another weaker station there. Go ahead. Yep, got you, Greg. You're very, very weak. Super weak. Anyway, all right, uh, we'll go to the top of the list. Graham, VK3GL in Bunyip. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Graham. VK3GL, <coughs> VK3CSJ, and uh, uh, yes, I noticed the uh, audio uh, as soon as I, I started the video. I could see that it was um, uh, pinging the the the, uh, the needle on um, on the mixer. So uh, the the levels between uh, my on air and uh, coming off the the computer uh, have to be adjusted. <laughs> Um, but um, yes, that uh, within the uh, the first uh, five ten seconds of that, it would have been a little bit harsh. Um, anyway, uh, there it is, and uh, thanks, Graham. 
Um, okay, and uh, I, I hope you can get your uh, air quality sense of working this weekend because I keep checking uh, your page and it's still blank numbers on the weather station information there for your air quality sensor. I'm not sure why that's uh, a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Anyway, uh, thanks, Graham. And uh, across to you there, Frank, VK3JR, VK3EKH. VK3EKH, VK3JR, good evening, Clint, good evening, everyone. Uh, Clint, uh, most interesting as usual, but particularly hearing about the, uh, the, the uh, frequency uh, Doppler uh, measuring for uh, flares That's, uh, and, and other things, perhaps. That's, uh, I'll be certainly getting uh, into that and uh, getting onto spaceweather.com there. So you saved the best to last as far as I was concerned, but it was all very interesting. Thanks for doing it. And uh, we'll uh, talk again next week or even possibly tomorrow morning, depending on how things go. VK3EKH, VK3JR. Yes, thanks, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH returning. What's happening tomorrow morning? Um, <laughs> or, oh, yeah, anyway. All right. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, uh, I, I kind of read, uh, as I was reading it out, I was uh, discovering as I was going along because I, uh, uh, I very quickly noticed the, uh, the interest in, in spaceweather.com with that, but I, I wasn't aware of the Doppler uh, aspect until I was reading it out uh, on air, so um, I'm, I'm going to investigate that myself actually, um, out of interest, and, uh, and have a bit of explore of that perhaps. But nevertheless, um, yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, good signal from you. Oh, and uh, Graham, too. Thanks for the signal report too. Uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I should be. I, I often, I have often said in the, at the start that uh, with my transmissions here on eighty, um, just if you've got a receiver that allows you to open it up fairly wide uh, in the IF side of things, then do so. Uh, you get nicer, nicer sounding SSB for what it's worth. Um, thanks, Frank. And uh, by the way, Frank, uh, I um, I was listening to uh, you and Steve on uh, Sunday afternoon. Or was it Saturday afternoon last week? Um, I can't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday afternoon. The, it, it, it was the afternoon session that Steve does um, on 1865. And uh, I noted the comment about... Um, uh, Steve uh, Bentley, VK3YJQ's uh, Moog synthesizer, and the way he likes to write, he will do his own music. So I've dropped, a, <clears throat> I've dropped him a note um, to uh, to to uh, uh, see if he can find some time to uh, to to uh, uh, to speak to Steve, uh, Mr. SL, and um, and do a kind of a, an interview whether pre-recorded or actually live um, but uh, talk about his interests there with his uh, his musical bent that he's got so I just thought I'd throw that into the works you might even might be listening there Steve so if you are Mr Bentley come up <laughs> all right thanks Frank uh, to uh, now we switch to the north and uh, bring in um, uh, Graham VK3 BDA the Bendigo district uh, astro astro um, that one, VK3BDA, VK3EKH. Yeah, thanks, uh, Clint, VK3EKH, uh, VK3BDA, uh, the call sign of the Bendigo section of the ASV. And um, good evening, everybody, and thanks for the net, Clint. It's all really interesting information as usual. And, um, yeah, you mentioned about listening to um, ABC. I like listening to ABC, particularly uh, ABC Radio National on 621am. Uh, particularly the um, science show on a um, Saturday after the midday news uh, and they um, uh, feature some astronomy information of course from time to time so uh, yeah I quite like uh, uh, Radio National and there's some other real interesting programs on as well and um, yeah I like uh, I like listening to uh, AM uh, I mean we can uh, we can get the Radio National Service via the digital TV network um, on the, um, the radio section. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still, uh, still kind of like listening to uh, AM uh, as well. So, um, and, yeah, your signal's really good. It's clean this evening, as usual, uh, 20 plus over uh, 9. And, uh, yeah, I, I tend to widen my receiver as well, so I get that uh, nicer audio quality sound. 
Um, yeah, well, the Bendigo section of the ASV is uh, kicking along, and um, the last meeting uh, this month was um, a meet up at the, uh, the local pub and a meal. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't make that one, uh, but I've been looking forward to um, to the uh, next one, and uh, we tend to alternate between having meetings at Discovery Centre. Um, on Zoom and uh, having a face-to-face -face meeting at, at, a, at a pub. So, um, uh, yeah, so there's a bit of variety there and it uh, offers those that may maybe uh, cannot make it to uh, the meetings uh, to still participate when they can via Zoom, etc. So it seems to be a, um, a good, uh, good combination. Um, yeah, not much uh, more to add, but um, yeah, a lot of interesting uh, segments on the on the news this evening. Queen's back to shore, and uh, so, yeah, it's pretty good with what you're doing every week, and it's like a, a one-stop shop for astronomy information <laughs> and what the latest is in, is uh, with the um, with the astronomy news. Um, yeah, and it is much of a shame, a very much of a shame about the recent. Uh, Tragedy with that submarine too, and um, you know they they often refer to it as being quite dangerous and uh, possibly even more dangerous than going into space now. So uh, yeah, that's how much we uh, we know about the depths of the oceans and um, um, how technology works or it doesn't work. And uh, um, yeah, still a lot more progress to be made as far as safety in the ocean with um, that type of thing. So. Um, yeah, OK, back to you there, Quinn, and good evening, everybody. VK3 EKH, VK3 BDA, the uh, call sign of the Bendigo section of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Back to you there, Quinn. Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 BDA, VK3 EKH replying, and uh, a final on, uh, on all comments there. And, uh, yes, I, I, it's, it's a shame that the... Um, the technology in this uh, uh, carbon fiber casing that this um, submarine or submersible uh, was designed f uh, with um, hadn't had more time more research to make sure that it was very safe <laughs> um, and it was very nice I was very happy to hear James Cameron's uh, comments that, that he made as well because uh, if there's anyone who knows about diving to great depths, uh, Mr. Cameron's one of them, and uh, he's done it many times. So uh, when you've got the right equipment that's been certified and all that sort of stuff, um, you got you haven't really got. I mean, it's a risk, whatever. But um, I think that the the probably the biggest tragedy here is that the the son and father um, who um, managed to convince his son to go with him. 19 years old and he, he apparently he didn't want to go he wasn't really keen on the idea at all but he was uh, eventually convinced to go so it's you know just tragic just really tragic um, anyway all right um, thanks uh, Graham excellent stuff and uh, we go across now to the south to pick up Martin down there in Launceston VK7 JAH VK3 EKH
not really observing. Uh, it's certainly a really difficult decision to make, I would have to say. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this part of that, I'm kind of hoping that things might clear up soon, and I might be able to take a telescope out into the uh, But in the meantime, concentrating on the radio, which is uh, a good thing, particularly when conditions aren't too bad. The test of the UK 2K7J, AHR. Yep, Roger Martin, VK7JAH, VK3EKH replying. Very good. Yes, no doubt the uh, the, the weather down your uh, your way would uh, be just that little bit cooler. It's uh, it's currently 8.3 degrees here at Narry Warren. <laughs> it's cold enough. The, uh, the, the air conditioner that I have downstairs, it's a 6 kilowatt unit, but it just doesn't quite warm up the downstairs environment. Oh, I've got to wear a jacket downstairs. It's just cool really feeling the cold this year and uh, I can uh, on a, a rural activity of being a bit on the minimum side fair enough and uh, there was something else you said there um, no, it's just, just left my mind anyway thanks Martin you're 10 over 9 averaging about 10 over 9 you can um, you can always um, uh, review this part of the the broadcast on YouTube so you can actually hear yourself because I'm piping you directly across and um, uh, so it's a direct feed into the system, so you can actually hear yourself how well you're coming through on uh, on the system here. Anyway, thanks, Martin. Good to hear. Thanks very much for calling in, uh, Stephen VK3SPX VK3EKH. Good morning, uh, afternoon, good evening. <laughs> K3EKH, this is EK3SPX. Um, yes, I think it is the evening. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting as usual. You started off uh, talking about Europa. There, that's an interesting place, isn't it? Uh, been the subject of a few science fiction films too. I'd like to, I'd like to go there as well, Clint. But I think it might be a tad inhospitable. But you never know. Someone might get there. Um, you know, in the next fifty hundred years. Who knows? Um, Transit planets. That's interesting too. Um, yeah, I've done that with the uh, with my telescope, uh, Clint. It's not too hard to do. It's a bit a little bit of specialised software, and you can uh, you can see a planet uh, transit come up, um, which is pretty cool, I've got to say. The, um, the the only method for amateur astronomers to find uh, or see planets in that way is the transit method, but it's not the only method. Because um, I think you mentioned they found uh, four thousand and missed one hundred and ten thousand with that method, but um, I'm not quite sure if that's the uh, the total number of uh, planets that have uh, estimated to be missed, but uh, there are a half a dozen other methods of detecting um, planets that uh, don't rely on the transits, but they're only really um, available with, um, with big telescopes and uh, super expensive equipment, etc. And um, Julian O'Shea, yeah, that was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, just the way... Um, it wrapped around once around the world to get to Proxima Centauri. Um, I guess it uh, might have just been a fluke or maybe they um, arranged it. But they did this. The scale was one to a billion, wasn't it? So I guess it's just a bit of a fluke that it uh, turns out that if you go once around, you get to Proxima Centauri on that scale. And Julian uh, O'Shea has got uh, quite a lot of videos, I've seen quite a few of them um, all around Melbourne. Um, you know, things about um, tram networks that don't exist anymore and freeways that uh, have been cut in half by, uh, or sorry, um, roads have been cut in half by freeways and all sorts of interesting things. It's, uh, he's quite an interesting bloke and I uh, highly recommend that. All right, uh, thanks very much, Clint. We'll uh, see you again next week. Thanks for the broadcast. Uh, VK3EKH, this is VK3SPX. Yeah, thanks, Dave. VK3SPX, VK3EKH. I'm going to have to uh, probably catch up with you at some stage about um, uh, the uh, transit uh, technique at uh, how, how, you, how you went about doing that. Um, but, uh, yeah, once I get the uh, observatory up and running... Um, I'll, um, it's just one of the things I'm looking forward to uh, to doing uh, with the telescopes. So, um, apart from just normal astrophotography and, and uh, you know, lots of other things, there are you know, variables and looking for comets and, <laughs> and trying to try and get my name on a, a undiscovered comet. Anyway, yeah, so all very interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so. Um, um, no, I hadn't heard of uh, O'Shea uh, until uh, he was interviewed last Friday morning, and um, he was talking about the um, uh, the labyrinth 
uh, under the city square. Um, it uh, it's a cooling uh, uh, system for um, air conditioning of the buildings on the city square, but it's um, it's the way it's all constructed to bring in air uh, off the Yarra and um, and have it so that it. Uh, it, um, it brings in air to the, the buildings that in the area. So it's for interesting engineering, let's say that. So he talks about that, and that's that's what kind of got me into his uh, his series, in which then I found the the uh, the uh, solar system uh, walk along the uh, St Kilda foreshore, which was uh, uh, was interesting. And it, the other interesting thing was that the involvement uh, it, with the ASV in in getting that uh, done as well for uh, the accuracy of it all. So it was all very interesting too. Um, all right, now across to Greg. Uh, you're not very strong, Greg, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. VK3 A W A Y VK3 C S J A E K H. Um, well, I can hear you, but it's um, it's just a little in the noise. Yeah, thanks, Greg. VK3 WAY, VK3 EKH. Yeah, just just a little bit weaker than normal, uh, Greg. I, I know you have a, a rocketing signal when you're at home, uh, but um, yeah, the station that you use down there is uh, needs a bigger antenna <laughs> uh, or a few more wombats. But uh, yeah. anyway, thanks for calling in, mate, and uh, stay warm. I'm sure it'd be chilly uh, down where you are, unless you've got a little bar heater keeping you warm. But nevertheless, no, thanks, Greg. Good on you. And uh, thanks for the comments. All right, is there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH listening. You've got VK3 TJS. Oh, my goodness, I forgot Jack. Yeah, sorry, Jack. I went right over you. I went from Steve to, yes, to Greg. Oh, my, my deepest apologies. Um, <laughs> VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. Take it away, Jack. Yeah, VK3, EKH, uh, and the group, this is VK3, TJS, and I'll forgive you that comes with the old age, I guess, and so we all forget, so never mind, it's all good. Um, beautiful broadcast, uh, all the way you were doing, like, you know, 20, 20 plus, up to 30 over, so uh, terrific signal and uh, interesting broadcast. I heard you mention about this star, but the good one talks about that, and I just can't uh, into some material that... Uh, uh, saying that uh, made up from two different materials, like one titanium, one's carbon fiber. Uh, titanium, you know, it uh, flexes carbon fiber very rigid, and uh, you don't know how how it behaves in uh, you know cold uh, cold temperatures and stuff. And also that stuff's been several times down there in uh, the depth, so could be a metal fatigue or, or material fatigue, or whatever. Or not. Anyway, try to whatever, whatever happens. Um, so yeah, thanks for the broadcast and uh, have a good weekend. We've got pretty well, we had a bad uh, day today. Like uh, it's been raining most of the day and very, very cold, like 10 degrees or something. So and when it's wet and cold, it's just it's much colder. But uh, hope for a better weekend, maybe. Uh, VK3 KH and the crew VK3 TJS. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Jack. VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH returning. Very good. Yes, um, <clears throat> I was talking to a, a friend at, uh, at work today about carbon fibre uh, technology and um, uh, even though carbon, well, I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure exactly, but I, it seems that uh, carbon fibre initially has strength associated with it, but after a while it fatigues and... Um, 
and of course, when when uh, what we were talking about is that apparently, although I'm not 100 percent sure myself, but uh, when when carbon fiber does fatigue to that point, uh, it will go. It will it will um, uh, it will uh, uh, fail uh, dramatically. So um, uh, I suspect that, um, as you say, in the in the cold water. And the pressure um, was the uh, combination of events, um, and the fact the uh, the particular uh, submarine or submersible had gone down had already gone down several times, um, more than ten, uh, from from what I know. So uh, yes, it was uh, probably uh, fatigued um, to some degree. Anyway, thanks, uh, uh, Jack. Uh, sorry for leaving you out. I should have uh, brought you in there, but uh, we have now. <laughs> Stay warm up there, and um, uh, we've only had a little bit of rain here today. Nothing, uh, nothing too much got registered in the rain gauge. Um, so, uh, yes, it's that time of the year. Anyway, all right. If there's no other stations, this is VK3 EKH. Um, the official station for the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And uh, if you want more information about the uh, society, just go to the website www.asv.org.au and uh, all will be revealed. So until uh, next Friday, take care, look after yourselves, stay warm, and uh, thanks very much for uh, listening in. This is VK3 EKH Nary Warren South with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. Cheers all. <laughs> no worries, uh, Frank. Nothing like the missions. All right. Uh, just, just a sec, Graham. I'm shutting down on on the other services. All right. So, to the fans of my YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you for watching for another Friday. We will broadcast again this Sunday morning, the WAA broadcast, 10.30 Sunday morning. There will be a session on YouTube as well as through the Melbourne TV repeater and uh, then repeat it again on Sunday night at 8 o'clock, uh, another repeat of the WAA news on ATV and, uh, and YouTube if I remember to activate it. Um, to everybody on the uh, uh, Discord channel, um, I think I've already mentioned it, but uh, cheers to you there, Daz, and uh, to Graham and uh, to Martin there, and uh, and um, uh, David, Mr. KDM, and anybody else there on the chat cord. So uh, thank you for watching, and uh, all the chaps up there on the, the email or two, but I think most of those are 80 meter listeners. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Look after yourselves. And uh, we shall shut down the YouTube feed. And uh, might as well do that on the ATV as well. This is VK3 CSJ, or EKH, Acker, <laughs> finishing up for, the, for Friday night. Bye, everyone.